Okay, so let's move on. So I'm, so I'm going to I'm going to show you. Um, as I mentioned early on, um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So, so when I originally did this, I completed the first canvas, did interviews, and this landing page is not something that I expect you to build um, immediately after your canvas or you know today, obviously. But this was this was an example of a landing page that we used uh, in the interviews to to test if this was a compelling enough value proposition. So at one point, we, we recognized that there's a lot of competition here. And we were doing things slightly differently, but we had to make sure that difference mattered, which is what the value proposition is, is really about. It has to be unique. And so we built this landing page where we had a screenshot of the app. Uh, we put that um, headline there, the fastest way to share your photos and videos. And then down below it, there was some segmentation, so helping parents share their photos and videos instantly. So we felt this communicated what we were about. We put this in front of people. This part here, I just I'd like you to ignore because it's a little bit further down. We had put it, built a video, and we were we had all that stuff up there. But I was really interested in testing three elements here: the headline, the subheadline, and the image. And so we put this in front of parents, and the first reaction was, "Well, I don't see anything different here." And we're like, "Well, why not? I mean, this is the fastest way to share your stuff." And they said, "Well, you know, our stuff is pretty fast. You know, it it." And so we really questioned them to find out, "Well, how fast was fast?" And so they said, well, if we were doing one-off pictures, obviously it was you know, a few minutes, and that was not really too bad. But if we were sharing a whole roll of stuff, you know, maybe it was 30, 40 minutes to get stuff uploaded and you know, sorted and all of that work. Sure, it was a little bit of work, but they were, it was manageable. We asked them what about videos, and videos was something that many of them wanted to do, but because they knew it was so painful, they weren't actually, they, they, it was not something that they were actually you know, doing because they knew it was painful and said, sure, you know, that one is painful, but uh, it's one that we don't quite do enough of just yet, but that's that's interesting. And so we said, well, you know, one, we, we can solve even the video sharing problem, but two, because we use the word instantly here, what we can do is share, you know, thousands of photos that's sitting in a folder or sitting in your application, your photo sharing app of choice, in 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 um, in seconds. I mean, it would be something where you say you point the software to this folder, and in seconds people will be able to log in because there's no uploading required, and it would be instant. And they said, well, that was not very clear to us. And we were kind of perplexed because we used the word instantly. And why didn't that make sense? And so we, I even went back and did a search uh, and found a Google ad that was a, a photo printing site. And the headline read, you know, get your photos, basically it said, get your prints instantly while you wait in 30 minutes. And so the word instantly is relative in people's mind. And that's one of those overused marketing terms where it just means fast. And even the word fastest doesn't quite really mean anything. So in, 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 in the value proposition uh, picking, there's a lot of these kind of words that you, if you use, you have to add more qualifiers. So a better way might have said, the fastest way to share your photos and videos in under five minutes. So once you constrain it, you actually make it be a lot more compelling than just fastest. It's like faster rel relative to what? And so similarly, simple and, and, um, and words like easy are things that Apple can get away with because they have built a brand around building simple products. But most of us can't because simple just doesn't mean anything to a lot of people. It's not unique or different enough for a lot of people. That's something that everyone claims they have. So this version wasn't obviously working. We, so in, the, the, the um, reason I kind of said ignore these for now is because we had, we, had, we had hoped that people would actually click on these videos to see just how simple this process was. And from our testing, um, when, when the first headline and he subheadline didn't resonate, people were just willing to move on. And what would happen in a, in a landing page scenario is people would read this and say there's nothing interesting here and not click on anything but just abandon the page, would just leave the page. So we were interested in trying to figure out how could we build something that would pull people in, what was going to be more compelling, would get their attention. And so we came up with the second version, which is where we use the principle of using these keywords. And so because we knew no uploading, once we told people that there was no uploading required, people always had this perplex, you know, perplexed look. And so we said we need to put that on the website somewhere. So we did two things. One is we, we, we made it a lot clearer who the segment, who the customer was. So we changed the first line from fastest photo sharing to being photo and video sharing for busy parents because we wanted to appeal to that customer segment. Um, and then as the word no uploading, no reorganizing, no hassle there. But on, we also put that splash burst where we said no uploading required. And we thought that would get attention. People would be excited. They would want to use this product or at least learn more about it. And so we put this landing page in front of parents and we had two reactions, and both of them were bad. So when we put it in front of people that were somewhat technical, they kind of looked at us and said, that's impossible. Like, there's no way you could not have any uploading. I want to know how this works. And so we're like, sure enough. So we spent you know, five minutes explaining the technology and how we were able to make that happen. 
and they were like, okay, you know, sure. So I can see how this works, and technically there's no uploading required. So okay, I understand it now. Um, when we went to the folks that were non-technical, what they told us is that there's no way this can work, and they're actually scared of it, and they wouldn't use it because everything they've done requires uploading. How can this actually happen? Like, what are you doing to your computer, or what? Are, what, are you, what how does this work? So we would spend another five minutes trying to explain a trying to explain how it works in a, in a less technical manner, and sometimes succeed, but more often than not, not succeed because we were not never able to to uh, to make them comfortable with with the answers we were giving them. And so this is an example where the words were getting attention, but they were actually creating kind of this lack of trust. Like people didn't think we were telling the truth. And on a landing page, that is killer. That, that will actually kill your landing page. So again, when people would hit this on a, on a, on a on kind of, a, if a stranger hits your landing page and sees something they don't trust, they're not going to say, well, let me figure out how this works and go to it. Even if you had put a how, the, how it works page on, on here or in a sub page, it's not something they would read. They would probably just leave before they even get there. So that's the reason why those, both, both of those reactions were bad. So we had to take a third stab at this, and we went back, and we actually decided to take a more kind of aspirational route. And so the first thing we did is realize that words matter, so we kept the same wording up there, but then we went to use an image. Um, and we had, by this point, realized that a lot of the people who were taking these photos were, were moms. And so we went and took a picture of a mom with a baby, holding the baby in a football position and typing on a keyboard. And when we showed this to people, the first reaction from especially moms were like, wow, that is, that is my life. That's, that's me every single day. And so they were nodding their heads before they even read any of this stuff. And that gives you that permission. That is that visceral problem, that visceral connection you're creating with your customers, which gives you permission to then come to the left-hand side and read the words that you're putting on there. And so once they, once they, they they've in their minds, figured out that we were talking to them and we connected with their problems, unconsciously they were more open to kind of read the rest of it. And here too, we weren't like pushing features and benefits. We had this um, finished story benefit, which talked about getting back to the more important things in your life faster. So it was not even about, you know, use our product because it's better than everyone else or we have got more features. But we, but we realized that this stuff is not what you want to be doing. Use our product because it helps you do it and, and get back to the more important things in your life. And so while that is not even talking about the features and benefits, that's an example in my mind of a good unique value proposition because it gets the attention of the, of the particular early adopter or of the particular customer segment you're going after and gives you permission to then t talk to them about other things. So below the fold here is where you would talk about the features and benefits that you're offering and why um, you're, you're able to kind of live up to the promise that you make up here. So hopefully that helps illustrate this. And so as I mentioned, this was, not a, this was not something we realized right after we created the Canvas. We had started with that fastest, um, fa fastest photo sharing app version in the beginning and just through multiple interviews be able to get to this version. Now I will talk about that process a little bit because that process was not also weeks or months. It really took us a week and a half to get to this version. So when we really started the, the interviewing with, with parents, we showed them that first version of the landing page and by the end of the week, all, all the answers I gave you were the answers we were getting repeatedly from these parents. Every parent was not, was, was not liking the first one. They were just getting confused by the second one and loving the third one, or at least being more engaged with the third one. And so we also decided to split test this qu quantitatively because we felt, you know, we've got these five people who actually like this version. Will it actually scale? Um, so we went and we, we did this landing page test, and we started driving traffic. We went and bought Facebook ads, stumble upon ads, um, and Google Ads, and we were driving traffic to these three variations. And by the end of the second week, it was still inconclusive. Even though we were getting all this traffic, um, we weren't getting enough numbers to make it statistically significant, because you have to drive a lot of conversions for those tools to actually declare a winner. And here we were, we continued the interviewing process, and we started to show these three versions, one after the other. And another five parents like, would, would basically like this version versus the other one. And so after the third week, we essentially just declared the quantitative test like useless because at this, at this phase, this was, this was enough evidence we needed to continue on and not waste time trying to gather all that, all that data. So that's an example where sometimes the qualitative testing can, can really trump the quantitative because not only do you get these definitive answers, but you get the whys. Like if it was just, I like this version, but they couldn't explain why, that would not be, that, you know, in my mind, that would not be sufficient enough. What we were getting is we liked this version because, and there were some, some really logical, valid reasons for why they picked one version over the other. And so we were able to stop that quantitative testing and just pick a winner with this version. 
the other thing that was even more interesting is that I'll, I'll share this in a slide later on, but we also found out that a, a lot of the parents were not really, um, like we asked them how they found their existing solution. And for many of them, it was not through Google AdWords, it was not through Facebook ads, it was not through StumbleUpon. They all got it because some friend of theirs referred them to a photo sharing site. And many times in, it, was, it, was a, it was a more techy you know, nephew or a spouse or someone else. And so it was kind of a word of mouth referral. So they weren't waking up one day and saying, let me go search on Google AdWords for a photo sharing site. And that made us really question even the quality of the testing we were doing, because we were getting clicks, but we didn't know if these were really parents, or they were just people like happily clicking on links for, for the hell of it. So it, it made us like even question that testing, and that's an example of channel testing, where you, you have to back it with the qualitative answers you're getting. And as I will show later on, the AdWords actually was, was a channel that I list here as one of my early channels. But after those interviews, we, we ruled that out, because it was not a, a viable channel to get moms that way, or get parents that way. Um, so, it, so, this, so, so, so this again illustrates the two points. One is that qualitative testing can trump quantitative testing in the earlier days because we're doing these bold hypotheses where you can very easily be able to test these radical ideas and see which one resonates more. But more importantly, when you put it in front of people, you actually get the feedback from them on why they like something and why they don't, which you cannot get with metrics, which you cannot get quantitatively. So until you're working at scale where you can drive really thousands of people to a site a day, um, the numbers don't have to be that high. But if you can really work at scale, then you can, you can actually rely more on quantitative metrics. But until then, it's going to be, it's going to be very hard. And you have to rely more on, on these kinds of interviews and, and testing that way. <laughs>